Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi, yes. Uh, I'm Melissa. Lena is here with me. Uh, okay, she's not physically here with me, but uh, good, good enough. Uh, everybody say hi to Lena. She can see you. Hello. Hi. You should all, this should all be sufficient proof that I'm not Lena, as people keep claiming. Um, I mean, I could have pre-recorded her, I suppose. No response to that? Yeah, that's fair. All right. And this is Tasting the Forbidden Apple. <laughs> Might be a little problem with the magic. Uh, magic's a, little, a very fickle thing. Uh, anyway, uh, the, this, I would like to start off the, to the talk with a little note about the status of the Asahi driver for the Apple M1 GPU. Uh, otherwise known as the AGX architecture or the G13 GB0 architecture, if you really like letters and numbers like I do. Um, and so where were we last year? Let's see. Last year, uh, we had the driver was upstream in Mesa, uh, which meant that we could do some basic OpenGL ES2 uh, applications a little bit of the conf the conformance suite, no actual applications, and all of this was running on macOS, which already has a driver stack, so not very useful. I mean, it was useful to me, <laughs> um, but then uh, passing about 95%, so very much prototype code, not a real driver, but uh, got the essentials there. So where are we now? Let's find out. Uh, almost passing for ES2, about 90% through ES3, and uh, yeah, Ella uh, has been f from uh, V3D fame has been starting work on a Vulcan driver, so uh, making progress on things. Anyhow, uh, the main thing I want to talk about is getting it right and getting the driver right. Uh, and this is not my first driver in Mesa. I have uh, did the Panfrost driver for a number of years. Uh, continue to work on that, uh, and I have learned a lot of hard lessons of how not to write a driver for from Panfrost. And as much as uh, talks like Jason's uh, with exciting titles like how not to write a backend compiler or how to write a Vulkan driver, you'd think I would have learned from them. But you know. This might be a vain effort, but here's how not to write an OpenGL driver. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is register allocation, especially given that uh, Daniel and Connor are out here in the audience, uh, who I owe a great, de great, great debt of gratitude to. Um, on, on the Apple GPU, uh, the, the, it matters a lot how many registers you use. Uh, the occupants, the, if you used more registers, occupancy will suffer, uh, performance will suffer. It's and there's not a single threshold. It's not you know half or full like it is on Molly. There are uh, many gradations of numbers of registers that you could use versus thread count. So we really want to be conservative with the number of registers. And spilling is of course very expensive. Uh, as at the end of the day, uh, as much as it gets, uh, as much as this is a very large system, uh, it's still a mobile GPU. I mean. You can dress it up in as many Pro Max Ultra Extreme Super Cool Awesome words as you want. It is this is this is a mobile GPU. <laughs> um, so the state of the art is to uh, do register allocation uh, it, it, while you are still have a program in static single assignment uh, form. And so the state of the art in Mesa is going to be the IR3, IR3 driver for Fredrino and the ACO compiler uh, for uh, for the AMD hardware. The problem, as I learned the hard way, is that you can't retrofit uh, this adult level register allocator into your driver. It, or at least you can, but it's very painful. Uh, ACO was designed this way from the start, as far as I know, uh, so I had skipped that problem entirely. IR3, sorry? Um, Okay. Um, IR3 did retrofit, but b at the time of retrofitting the uh, the new register allocator, there was not existing spilling support, so a lot less of a differential to deal with. When I look at something like Molly, where we already have a production driver that does spilling and does uh, allocation, does all the all the good stuff, and now suddenly think, you know what I really need? I need more static single assignment form, and then you end up in in a hole with private branches that are thousands of lines different to upstream and will, at this rate, may never be landed because it's not good enough yet, even though it's 
better. And that's just not a fun hole to be in. So we don't want to be there. So what do we do? We do a static single assignment form from day one. Uh, this is the tree scan algorithm. It's based uh, roughly on the ideas from ACO and IR3. I will not be going into detail for that. If you want, in, if you want to see that, look at the excellent talk by Daniel and Connor from last year. Um, at this point, the basic stuff is working. Uh, I have managed to crib a little bit of code from IR3. Most of it I have not been able to just because of differences in how the, uh, the compilers are designed. But uh, we're getting there. So happy on there. Another problem, one that I've also hit the seen the hard way and also failed to see the light from the far wiser people in this room, um, was uh, how you deal with uh, representing image layouts in the driver. Uh, for, in many cases, it's very tempting to make your driver just always do linear textures and linear frame buffers and I'll deal with performance later. Uh, that does not work when you have hardware like AGX, which literally does not support linear f uh, frame buffers for any but for anything other than like Windows system integration. Uh, so we have to do the t we have to use twiddling or tiling from the start. And th the pattern for doing the twiddling is very complicated and very easy to get subtly wrong. And that's even for just regular block based for regular formats. When you include block based compression, especially the ARM scalable texture compression, which does not even necessarily have power of two block sizes, you can have you know five by five block sizes. Oh well, uh, a lot of ways to screw up your screw things up. Uh, it's easy to pass your test, but it's not actually work. Not not ideal. So how do we solve it? The same way people smarter than I have solved it, with the uh, ISL, with an ISL like library for Intel, uh, NIL for the uh, NVK driver, which you heard about this morning. Uh, you have having a dedicated library that only is concerned with laying out services, not allocating the memory, just determining the layout. Uh, it turns out this matters a lot, and it means you can actually worry about correctness in the place that counts. Because it, you think, oh, well, you just multiply stride by height, and that's your size, but that doesn't work when you have all of these complicated details to worry about. And the formula get very subtle with lots of little edge cases. And if you try to open code this in your driver, as every driver has tried, uh, in many cases you get it wrong. And for AGX, certainly we got it wrong. So we... Uh, we have the AIL library with the garlic mascot. Um, this is a complete clone of ISL because I, as I've learned every time I try to be clever and be smarter than the people in this room, I realize that the people in this room are smarter than me and I should have listened to the adults in the first place. Uh, so uh, yeah, the way ISL does it, you use unit suffixes for everything, which means you get dimensional analysis uh, working. You get no more bugs where you should have divided by block size or maybe multiply by block size. Who knows? It's shrug. It's all pixels, right? And it's not all pixels. Um, and you unit test everything. And because there's no allocation, it's very easy to have, you know, a thousand unit tests for uh, that are just generated from actual hardware behavior or known good driver behavior. And so that's means you can be very sure of correctness in a way that you're just not going to get from running a small sample of conformance tests or applications. So this is all in all what I feel is a good idea and would highly recommend if your driver does not abstract out image layouts already, you should do that. Uh, and also just much more subtly or puzzly, I guess, there's a lot of best practice in Mesa and again, I have tried to be very creative in the past, and every time I do something clever, I regret it afterwards and le learn I should have just done the thing that everybody else in Mesa already did in the first place. And you can't really go back on your decisions. And I know there's nothing sacred in tree, but refactoring is just pain, and I just don't just don't have pain. Uh, it's very very simple philosophy. Yes. Uh, so again, for the AGX driver, we are trying to follow all the all the things that Mesa has learned over the years and that I have painfully learned uh, over the years. Uh, Gen XML from day one, instead of having bit fields, uh, th the weird three space indentation that everybody has for reasons I don't understand, but uh, if you don't do it, then you can't copy code around and I uh, baffles the mind. Um, and getting the UAPI right, which is actually not my, my department, but uh, I think I know whose department it is.
Lena seems very happy to hear about that. Uh, but, but before we get there, I uh, want to just talk about what's coming next for, the, for my part and Mesa for this driver, namely all of the good stuff from GL3 the, and or GLS3 that will uh, is needed for Vulkan and needed for apps right now. For example, compute shaders and multiple render targets. M multiple render. I should have maybe put these on the same line because for some reason that. Uh, again, baffles the mind. Um, these are connected on AGX. Um, remember when I said that AGX is a tiny little mobile GPU that's just you just add you know crazy Pro Max extreme words after the end of it? Yeah, so that means it's a tile. It's a tiler with a tile buffer and has a very small tile buffer, 32 kilobytes, uh, and which means if you have lots of data per pixel, you have to have very small tile sizes. Uh, a tiler like Molly can solve this very easily. Uh, the driver calculates the tile size based on uh, how much data you need per pixel. So if you use, if you have absolutely massive pixels due to, you know, eight render targets and multi-sampling and and 32-bit float formats, well, the driver will just use four by four tiles and performance will suffer, but uh, it still works conceptually. How does this work in AGX? Well, conceptually the same, but you only get three tile sizes to choose from, 32 by 32, 32 by 16, and 16 by 16, which if you do the math of 16 by 16 uh, versus a 32 kilobyte tile buffer, uh, you very quickly realize that you do not have enough space to do the, the API requirements for the Kronos APIs. Scratch that, you don't even have enough for metal. Um, there is a corner case on the metal driver for this chip where if you use too large of a tile size or too many bytes per tile, uh, the driver, Apple's driver uses what's called large MRT, large multi-render target mode. And this is a very fancy way of saying that it just stops pretending to be a tiler and it starts pretending to be an immediate mode renderer. And in the fragment shader, it will start storing, spilling uh, to a linear image in memory uh, and re loading back from a linear image in memory for blending. And uh, okay, well, we can't actually use linear images because we need to still have the frame buffer compressions. So that doesn't really work. So, oh, I know. We'll do. We'll write out the tile buffer, and then we'll load back the linear image into the tile buffer, and then write out the tile buffer again a second time. And the second time, so we get to get compression both times. That's why it'll be fast. Great work, Apple. Excellent design, and. Speaking of excellent designs, uh, this excellent design will soon be coming to Linux. And I will now turn it over to Lena, who should be all too happy to tell you about that uh, exercise. Ah! Audio good, video good, all good. All right, um, so yeah. When's the final time there was um, a very We lost your audio. Still don't have your audio. Why? Wow, that didn't make any sense. Uh, we can. Okay. I'll, I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> can you hear me now? Are we good? Yes? No? Yep, we are good to go. We're good. Yes, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, Alright. So, once upon a time, there was a very scary, magical, and um, mysterious black box. And then that, uh, that black box was the Amon GPU. And so... Oh, I'll see what happens, sorry. And that guy and I talked to, to the Amon GPU um, in a strange, magical language that we couldn't understand. But, you know, thinking through about it, what can we do about this? Well... Why don't we put a hypervisor on Mac OS? And so we did. And using this hypervisor, um, we were able to uh, slowly understand the magical language that Mac OS spoke to the GPU. And uh, with its wonderful um, magic ring buffers and all of its crazy structures and its pointers, the pointers, the more structures, the more pointers. And so we have this uh, interesting hypervisor that um, uses a strange and bizarre language called Python. And in Python, we can write scripts that let us interpret this magical language. These are scripts in parcel tongue. Something like that. And 
do that. So uh, with another fork, we can get uh, some tech things where we can run macOS and uh, see every render command and all the structures and pointers to structures and more structures that are involved. And this is super nice. And we can uh, slowly figure things out that way. Um, also, by the way, this is a single 3D render command and it's 730 lines of um, structure. Uh, but uh, anyway, you know, now we have um, all these structure definitions by these structure definitions in Python, and uh, they look kind of like this, which is pretty convenient and easy to write. And uh, so I had an idea. Now that we have all of these nice definitions in Python to parse and read these structures from memory that NetOS writes, what happens if we add more Python and instead of parsing and reading these structures, we generate these structures and uh, we can write a GPU driver in Python. And so we did. And after the first magic ex um, experiment, we were um, rendering triangle. And a little bit later, we were um, pulling rabbits out of our heads. Uh, but, you know, could, could we go a little bit deeper? Could we um, throw even more magic into this little um, experiment? Why? Why don't we try putting Python into Mesa? I yeah, probably know I did not merge this code. This is definitely a great idea. Um, why don't we um, embed a Python interpreter into DR and Shim? And then we can run the entire IGX Python prototype driver in process in Mesa. And it will talk in its wonderful language to the M1 over this strange protocol called USB 2.0 at a breathtaking 480 megabits per second, copying all dirty buffer objects back and forth every single frame. Come on, this is an awesome idea, and you know it. I'm going to the EGB now. Uh, but yeah, we tried that. And you know what? It worked. Your stream is keep running on a separate host machine, Intel based, and it's using regular Mesa with an SS driver and a, um, you know, prototype UAPI, but it talks to the RM shim, which embeds a Python interpreter, which embeds the entire AGX driver, uh, which then talks over USB to the M1, which renders everything, and it can uh, then copies the frame buffer to the HDMI frame buffer and displays it in a file. And it's not just game, it's cute. I was able to get, you know, TTD working and running myself at about um, 0.5 FPS. Uh, but yeah, it works. Um, so how, how complicated is this GPU driver? Uh, um, if we look through the code, uh, 91 structure definitions in the entire driver. That's not very um, simple. And the worst part is that if you get it wrong, if you get any of this wrong, the framework just crashes. At least you get my scratch them, so come on. And, you know, if any of the pointers are wrong, the framework crashes. There's no bounce checking, so if any numbers are wrong, the framework crashes. There are some asserts, and also just make it panic. And the worst part is that the framework is loaded by iBoot, which runs, that's Apple code that runs before our code runs. And so there's no way to reload the firmware because it has a data section. Um, and so the firmware crashes, the only way to fix it is to reboot the entire machine, which is terrible. Well, this sounds like a great design to me. We should all go okay. do things the way Apple does them. You know, uh, so what do we do about this? What could they possibly do to make it practical to run a GPU driver for this architecture and that it's actually going to work? Why don't we write the driver in Rust? You see, uh, Rust is magic because it can represent all those GPU pointers um, as tight pointers and it can give them lifetime bounds so that um, it checks the compile time that all your GPU objects live as long as the um, Oh, sorry, all the GPU objects live as long as the objects that point to them. And uh, so we can use all of this magic, kind of these magic spells to tie parent objects, the child objects. And um, when all of this is set up, the cleanup is just magic. Um, when Rust drops something, it will drop the um, child structures at the right time. And so the compiler checks all of this and will stop you from breaking the rules so that the framework doesn't crash. It's great. It's amazing. So here's a, a little example of how that works. 
We have a raw module which contains structures that represent actual GPU memory um, that are shared with the firmware. And so in this case, we have a notifier structure that is in charge of telling the firmware when we want it to notify us of a event like a render completion. And so in this case, that notifier has a pointer to another structure, which is a threshold. And so we represent that with a type called GPU pointer. And you will notice that there is a lifetime there, the apostrophe A. And so that means that the threshold object has to live at least as long as the notifier object. And then um, later outside the raw module, we declare a separate structure also called notifier. Um, but this one actually represents the CPU side, um, you know, metadata or whatever state we need to keep um, to talk about this notifier. And in this case, um, that includes the actual threshold object, the um, GPU object structure that represents, um, you know, ohms and represents the actual allocation and everything related to that threshold object in terms of um, rest on the CPU. And then we have a GPU struct implementation for that notifier, which ties together the two structures, the raw one and the outer one. And in this case, it uses a generic associated type. So it passes through that lifetime, which means that the implementation of all the magic uh, behind the scenes can use that to tie the lifetimes of the objects together. And uh, this is how this works. Uh, we have a um, allocator here, and uh, that is going to allocate a new notifier object. And if you focus on these two bits, you'll see that first uh, we create the CPU side notifier object, and that has the threshold, which is also just allocated as a default. Um, but also then there's a callback after that, um, that is um, that gets a uh, closure passed to it. And that closure um, takes two parameters, the inner um, structure that we just created, the notifier, the CPU side, and a pointer to the GPU side structure that is about to be um, populated. And so we have some uh, magic um, placement stuff here, uh, which I can talk about later if you want. Uh, but the important part is that when we actually uh, instantiate this raw notifier, we give it a GPU pointer that is obtained from the inner structure um, and the threshold member from there. And you can't see it in this part of the code, but because of the way the lifetimes are set up, this only works if you actually use a GPU pointer from the notifier that is um, that is contained that, is, that contains that threshold. So if you try to use the GPU pointer from somewhere else, from some other random object, the compiler would complain because the lifetimes would mismatch. So this is super cool because the compiler is checking for us that all the objects live as long as they have to live and therefore we can't crash the firmware that way. Another issue that we have is that the firmware ABI is unstable because of course it is. Um, so Apple changes the driver and the firmware ABI randomly um, whenever they feel like it. Thankfully, we don't have to support um, arbitrary firmwares because we get to pick what firmwares we support and we um, install when we install Linux. Um, but we do need to support more than one firmware because there will be new um, generations and bug fixes and things like that. Um, so we can't just support a single firmware forever. And yeah, so these firmware versions have different ABIs and different structure definitions. So what do we do? Well, Rust can help with that too. We can use more Rust magic and write a proc macro that replicates the code for every version, but not the entire code, um, just the parts that change. So there's a macro and what it does is it appends the version name um, to the um, um, the type names of so the structs or enums or whatever. But also within those on types, the fields and the code can be conditional. And you can have multiple dimensions like the firmware version and the GPU generation. Uh, and you can have comparison expressions. And this is super cool. Um, so that looks like this. Um, you have a versions macro uh, that is um, it gets past AGX. That just means to use the AGX um, version matrix. And then uh, you have things like this, where this field is conditional on the firmware version. So it only exists if the firmware is newer than that one. And even later, um, you have um, two pointers. And those pointers are two structures that are themselves versioned. And so there's that little code one colon for tag, and that's a magic um, marker for the uh, structure, uh, sorry, for the uh, macro. And that gets replaced with the uh, uh, the version name and dependent to the structure name. So in the end, all structures point uh, to the uh, inner structures that have the same version. But of course, before we can use any of this, we need to write um, REST DRM bindings. So I started working on that and, you know, writing bindings can be pretty uh, hairy and uh, involve a lot of black magic. This is part of um, 
the code that sets up the IOCTO um, array for um, DRM driver. But the good news is that it's actually very easy to use. So this is what the driver side looks like. And it's pretty simple. You just um, declare your driver, tell it what types you want your driver to use, some basic information, and then declare uh, DRM IOCTOs, and just pass it a list with the IOCTO names, um, the structs, and uh, the facts, and the um, callback that you want to call for that IOCTO. And that macro um, takes care of writing all the uh, C compatible uh, Rust wrappers and doing all the safety stuff. So you, that you can just write your IOCTOs in, in Rust. And, uh, you know, everything uh, just looks uh, normal. Um, so, did it work? Did this Rust experiment actually get us somewhere? Uh, let's see. Uh, on September 9th, um, 20, uh, sorry, on September 24th, um, I, f I got the first uh, renderers out of the uh, Rust driver, and this is KMS Cube. Um, KMS Arrow wasn't even working properly yet, so this is actually a frame buffer dump taken manually. Uh, but that was, you know, the very first renders. And just five days later, I had a full GNOME session running with Neverbaugh and Inner TV rendering and Firefox and YouTube playing and everything. Rust works! There are no concurrency issues. Everything just worked multi-threaded after working single-threaded. No UEFs, no leaks. Um, other bugs were like core MM bugs and logic stuff, or, you know, really dumb mistakes in unsafe code. Um, I think that Rust encourages good design, so you end up architecting the driver in a way that like, sort of um, leads to the code, um, you know, having fewer bugs. And then the compiler is super picky and annoying, but when it works and when it compiles, it's like 90% of the way to working. It's really, really cool. Um, this is my first time doing a major thing in Rust, and I think it's the future. Uh, but there's still lots to do, of course. Um, we need to fix TLV and validation. Right now, I'm kind of turning off the GPU every single render pass. Uh, look, it only takes two milliseconds, okay? Um, but, uh, don't worry about it. Yeah, um, yeah don't, don't worry about it. Um, but uh, we need to fix uh, some easy perf issues, the debug spam, uh, the allocator is really dumb. Those are easy. Um, and we also need to port it to the M1 Pro Max Ultra, which is the G13X. And also the G14 and GVM2. We don't really know much about that one, but you should find out. Um, but most importantly, we need to design and implement the real UAPI because, as Alyssa said, we want this to be a Vulkan first, uh, modern, and properly designed UAPI. The current one is just a demo hack. Um, so that's going to require a lot of driver changes and a lot of Mesa changes. Uh, but we want to do it and uh, get it right the first time. So, yeah, there's still lots to do, but things are looking good. And um, I'm guessing you all want to see a demo, right? Right? You want to see a demo? I, th I think you already saw the demo. Didn't didn't they see the demo, Lena? Yeah, I, I think they already saw the demo because we've kind of been running this on an M1, um, you know, running a known session uh, with Firefox, and uh, I'm, j I'm just hanging around here, and, you know, I'm just uh, running a T2D window. Um, Let's see screen fetch. Like it's, a, it's just a screen grab, um, you know. And this is just Firefox. Uh, what else do we have? Yeah, this is the... In a TCD um, blog, here's the magic wand that Alyssa is using. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Should we try Neverball? Run everything at the same time as Neverball, see if it works. Hey, look at that. Some time for Q&A, maybe? Uh, yes, we have a question online already. So regarding firmware versions, are interface changes between versions discovered dynamically or have to be reverse engineered for each version to be supported? Um, they have to be reverse engineered for every version to be supported. Uh, the good news is that because we can use the hypervisor, we can pretty much just run macOS for that version. Um, I am really bad, bad at Neverwell. Uh, we can just run macOS um, for that version, and it's usually pretty obvious when those fields are misaligned. Um, either the Python will actually throw an exception, or you can just kind of see that the, you know, the, the fields are not where they're supposed to be. Um, so it's not very difficult to find the changes, because they tend to be just adding and removing single fields. Um, the worst part is the initialization data. There's like some structures that are like over um, 64 kilobytes of nonsense, and there's a lot of changes there. Um, but thankfully, they're aesthetic, so you can just um, sort of work through it. And because the hypervisor supports live reloading of the tracer scripts, you can just boot macOS and see if it fails or, you know, the parse is wrong, and then just interrupt it. 
and then just iteratively um, edit the structure definitions in Python and just run one command and try again. And you don't have to reboot or anything. So um, I think I ported it to, um, I have, we support two versions now, and I ported it to the uh, second version in one day. So it's not actually that bad, um, though there are, I think, about 100 changes in total from one to the other. But, and, you know, the actual um, cycle is pretty fast. I, oh, yep. Hey, um, about the version that you showed. Um, um, I, I can't hear that. Yeah, I don't think you So the version macro, um, does that over time just generate copies of the same structs for every single firmware version, and does it eventually explode in size, so to speak, or is there a way to deduplicate? Um, the permutations that are generated. Uh, did you hear that? Um, somewhat. Um, I think yeah, the question was about whether the versions macro um, generates the code for every version and then sort of explodes code sites. Um, the answer is yes. Um, for every version, like down the tree that has version dependencies, um, not the whole driver though, only the, the parts that actually change. So any structures that don't change, um, those can not be, ver be not versions. Um, but I mean, honestly, um, I don't think people are going to be too worried about their GPU driver being a couple megabytes. And, um, you know, in the end, the actual runtime code that is going to be, you know, using the cache and all that is just going to be the versions for whatever you're currently running. Um, so I'm not really too worried about that. Um, it does increase compile time, though, roughly proportional to the um, number of versions. So what I usually do when I'm debugging is just um, disable all but the version that I'm currently compiling for. Um, but again, that's not actually that bad. And by the way, people complain about Rust on compile times, but uh, at least in the kernel, it's not actually that bad. I think it's similar to C. Uh, the main difference is that Rust compiles basically the whole driver at once, so it doesn't really do incremental linking of like modules in the driver. But it does, also doesn't really take longer than C. I mean, it's a few seconds for uh, for my driver, so it's it's not really a bad um, development experience. And um, like the, the test cycle for us also is uh, only a few seconds to reboot the machine and load a new kernel. So that's, um, that's the more important part. All right, thanks. Uh, so there's a, another question from the live audience. Uh, this one is for mm -hmm. Alisa. Uh, so I know AGX is a tiling renderer, and uh, so you say it's a mobile GPU, but literally aren't all GPUs in the past few years uh, also were tilers? Example, NVIDIA since Maxwell, AMD since Vega, Intel since Gen 11. Is there still a meaningful distinction between those uh, and AGX that makes it a mobile GPU, where those were not? Uh, so... I I should, I guess, have the disclaimer that I only work on uh, mobile ARM hardware. I'm not super current on what's happening in the uh, in, t in the uh, x86 space. Uh, that being said, there are, I do think there are distinctions between the uh, traditional tilers, namely Molly and Imagine Apple. Um, I, I do hope you guys have liked hearing about our PowerVR driver. Um, I mean our AGX driver, our Apple driver, the Apple GP. Sorry, I had a slip. Had a slip there. Uh, uh, so, uh, th thank you, Frank. Um, I. So I do think there's a, a distinction between some of these traditional tilers uh, that follow the very pure uh, tile buff. Everything goes through the tile buffer. Um, you have the dedicated tiling stage. Uh, vertex, the output of vertex shaders have to go through main memory uh, because of tiling, or at least the tiles, the tiler output goes through main memory. Um, it's my understanding that the more uh, slightly higher, less pure tilers have, for example, Qualcomm has the immediate mode. Um, oh, I see we're, okay. Uh, <laughs> Not a great idea, but I love it. Uh, <laughs> uh, I know Qualcomm can switch to immediate mode rendering um, in some cases. It's my understanding that what the desktop GPUs have that are tilers are not, it, the traditional tiler sense are just borrowing some of the better ideas of them. But honestly, that's a question for someone who works on Intel or AMD or NVIDIA. I'm not qualified to answer that. 
Uh, yes, thank you. So we have another question, this time for Lina. Uh, this seems very stable, so you that could uh, do the whole presentation on top of your code. Is it usually this stable or should this be done only by professionals? <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's the funny thing. After, um, so it was completely crashy and I was getting firmware um, asserts and things like that and I wasn't sure what the problem was. I did know that there was some issues with TLB and validation because um, I could see that like the kernel was crashing and then I dumped uh, the memory and it was um, tile buffer pointers. Uh, and But I wasn't sure how bad it was. And um, then I went to sleep and I woke up the next morning and I had the you know genius um, idea of waiting for the GPU to turn off um, after every render, which I knew cleared the DLBs. And uh, what can I say after I did that? I don't think I've actually seen it crash once, and we don't even have GPU fault, like user space fault recovery yet. So if a single GPU fault occurred, it would just crash everything. It's not happening. Um, I mean, obviously, the turning off the GPU thing is a terrible hack and destroys um, performance. But I mean, it's still rendering at about 60 FPS or at least 30. Not sure. Um, I think I think my capture card is 30, but the it's probably getting more more like 60 um, in the actual rendering. Um, so. Yeah, like, I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, we need to fix that. Um, but I think once we fix the TLB issue, it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty stable. Um, I saw it saying Rust works. Like, once things, you know, like, once the logic is correct, all the weird, you know, highs and bugs and concurrency issues and, um, like, we, I just find green locking, right? This isn't the big driver lock. Um, and all that just works. And the, the whole fearless concurrency, um, you know, setting point of Rust is real. Yes. Hello. How do you plan to handle like complete major firmware revisions with that like version macro thing that you are doing? Like, what if the structure like completely and entirely changes? Your hardware can't be represented by the macro. You may need to repeat that. Um, I think I think uh, the the question was, what if everything changes? Like, it's not just minor changes to the structures. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um. So. Uh, I think Apple isn't a big fan of making major changes like that. Um, but if like um, like sub modules of the um, of the driver um, end up changing significantly, then we can just um, have like different Rust modules, and I can probably just make a change to the frog macro to support like importing differentially or something like that. It shouldn't be that difficult, um, or to just um, like build versions for a subset of versions, and then we can have like multiple versions of the code actually copied and pasted and changed completely. Um, and then, you know, one applies to some versions and the other to other versions. I thought of that. I'll probably add a conditional to the versions macro so they can do that. Um, but we don't really expect it to be, you know, that bad, um, at least uh, for a few generations. So we'll see about M2. I don't expect it to be very different, though, because Apple do seem to share the same firmware code base for different GPUs, and they have their own house inside and you can kind of see this from strings in the firmware um and they do seem to have like i saw some um debug logs uh from like ios you know like four gpu revisions back uh that it were very verbose and had a lot of interesting details and like everything in there matched everything i know about this one so i don't think apple are very likely to do like a major change to the firmware design um such that like we need to make a complete break Yes, we have more questions from people uh, attending virtually. So for Lina, have you run into any roadblocks or unexpected issues being, I believe, one of the first people to create a new Linux driver in Rust? Um, so I ran into some things. One of the biggest ones is that um, Rust doesn't have placement new, which means that it can't instantiate objects in memory that you allocate using a custom allocator. Um, it basically can only instantiate objects in the stack. And um, the compiler can optimize some of those copies, um, but it's not guaranteed. And so this GPU has, you know, some structures that are over 64 kilobytes, um, and they're sync, you know, they're fixed layout. It's not like we can break them up. Um, and yeah, you know, if that goes on the kernel stack, that uh, stack overflows. Um, so that's why I had that place macro that I showed earlier. That is a crazy, um, ridiculous, you know, voodoo dark magic Hezrich or. Um, Micro, um, though it does work, um, we can improve it to make it a bit more, a uh, bit safer and a bit nicer to use. Um, but what that macro basically does is it parses the um, like uh, structure initialization um, 
syntax recursively and then initializes every field separately and checks that they all have been initialized so that it basically um, piecewise instantiate the structure directly at the um, target location and then avoids having to have it on the stack. But yeah, this isn't really nice. And I do hope that Rust grows um, placement new support someday so we can avoid this. Um, but it's not a showstopper. Other than that, um, that's pretty the major one. There's, there's been a few minor things, but pretty much everything can be worked around. Um, obviously, it's still a work in progress, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with uh, the current state of things. So, what is currently missing for other M devices to be supported? Is it just the firmware struct? Uh, uh, for all the other devices, sorry? Uh, all the other M devices to be supported. Is it just the, the firmware struct or something else? It's really, I, f I mean, honestly, the firmware would be the least of my worries. Um, for the M1, for the, anything that's in the M1 series, those are all uh, the same version of the ma major version of the architecture, G13. Uh, so uh, already I know uh, somebody tried actually running the Mesa driver on Mac OS uh, on a uh, M1 Max system and found that it almost worked, but there was some graphical glitches. So what that tells me is that there are going to be some minor changes needed everywhere in the stack, both Mesa and kernel. Uh, but for the most part, I expect once uh, once you know, Lena gets her hands on a uh, M1 Pro machine, that should that should be fine. The bigger issue is going to be the M2, uh, which is a different. I bl I believe that's going to be a different major architecture, G14 instead of G13, uh, and I I don't actually know yet how uh, how different the architectures are going to be from either the kernels or user spaces perspective. Um, there is a very big gap in terms of different uh, different hardware manufacturers' attitudes towards uh, randomly changing everything every generation for no reason whatsoever. Uh, on one hand, you have you have hardware uh, you have hardware engineers that uh, try their best to only change things when there's a need to change them because you know verification is expensive and so that makes things easier for us. Uh, on the other hand, you have hardware engineers who know that if they make a if they make a good GPU, uh, then they have no more job anymore because the GPU job is done. So. Uh, you just have to keep making changes to justify everything. And it makes things really hard on the driver people, but we're not going to complain because that means we continue to have work to do too. So um, buy lots of new GPUs. Um, honestly, we, given that I've only seen a single, uh, a, a single Imagine Apple GPU so far, uh, I'm... It's. Uh, I don't know what the attitude is going to be. We know uh, from other other parts of the Apple uh, system on chip, they don't seem to they don't seem to make backwards compatible breaking or non backwards compatible changes without good reasons to. So, if we're lucky, uh, it should be pretty easy. If we're unlucky, oh well, guess we have a new driver to write. Um, I don't expect it'll be either extreme, I don't know yet where to predict where it'll be for Mesa, and Lena may have other perspectives on how that'll be for the kernel, but ultimately uh, I can be pretty sure that M2 will require changes for both of us. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if there's like um, actually zero changes to the structures for M2 because like they they wrote that into a firmware upgrade, so we support, you know, a firmware version that supports M2, and like that was all back, you know, it's the same code base, so they ended up with the same structures. Um, but then again, they might um, have some if diffs there um, or an actual fork. So it could be either of those. Um, there's definitely going to be a lot of changes to the initialization data, to all the constants. There's giant piles of constants. Um, so all that, you know, when we get to the M2, we'll see what changes and move those to um, configuration structs um, that we can uh, have different values for different generations. Um, but yeah, the, I think the, the more interesting question is what Alyssa said, the, uh, the user space side and how much they changed in the pipelines and all those um, commands and, and all that stuff. What The one part that does uh, make me cautiously optimistic, and I do have to underscore cautiously when we're talking about hardware engineers here, uh, is uh, the archaeology I did uh, trace comparing the uh, what what I have reverse engineered from the Apple GPU to uh, the PowerVR RGX uh, driver that's now upstream in Mesa, and for the bit of history. Uh, 
I started I started reverse engineering AGX uh, before before the PowerVR open source driver actually materialized. So that was very much a uh, in the dark for me. And even once the code dropped, I could tell that there were things in common, but it was not yet obvious how to actually match up um, structures in PowerVR to structures in uh, AGX. Uh, over time, with more insight into both the PowerVR and AGX sides, it became clear you know, there are data structures that are essentially identical between the two. There are data structures that have nothing in common. Um, I can see the clear lineage. I can see where they diverged many years ago. And actually, if you go if you go digging through uh, through old iOS versions, uh, I I keep talking about the G13 architecture that's in the M1. Uh, I can see there was an AGX all the way of G4, which was in you know a 2014 era iPhone or something. So. Uh, the M1 may have come out of nowhere if you weren't paying attention, but this is not a new architecture. This has been in your in your iPhone for years. You've just not noticed. Um, so in that sense, I can see the progression. Given how much I've been able to learn from the PowerVR driver, despite them diverging so many years ago, that makes me hopeful that actually it might they might not be changing things so aggressively. Uh, once you have all of those years of divergence, there's enough different that it doesn't make sense to share a driver between the modern power VR and the modern AGX. Uh, if we could roll back the clock 10 years ago, we and we were reverse engineering the iPhone and uh, the imagination people wanted to do an open source driver and then, and we kept working on both simultaneously, then yeah, at this point, we'd probably be supporting one, both in one driver stack. And it'd be a mess, and we'd be constantly bitching about it, and we'd be dis determining, you know, trying to decide when we should when we should fork off, like Intel finally did for uh, Crocus and Iris, for example, or Anv and HasVK. Um, but... At the end of the day, these they have the common lineage. Uh, there are lots of nonsense fields and data structures that I would not have been able to determine no matter how long I stared at them, except for the fact that the answer is literally right there in Mesa nowadays. So uh, like I said, thank you, Frank. And I believe I'm out of time now. Uh, yes, we are out of time. Awesome. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, thank you for having Lena here.